This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Maybe you're Hector Bones or Tim Ashman or Johnny Hernandez, but whoever you are, we thank you for making this show possible. Coming up on DTNS, Google gives a big boost to password-free logins, a way to use an MRI to log the words you hear in your mind, man. And is it T-Mobile's fault they got breached nine times in five years? Where's the line, T-Mobile? Come on. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Oh, my friends, we are going to talk about your brain today and uh -huh. how you can stick it in an MRI and f not really find out what you're thinking, but kind of find out what you're thinking. We'll explain. Let's start with the quick hits, though. AMD announced four new CPUs for ultra-portable notebooks, ranging from four to eight Zen Core cores with integrated RDNA 3 graphics and an FPGA AI engine. AMD claims its Ryzen 7040U chips are faster than Apple's M2 system on a chip, but we don't have word on when we'll see these laptops or any laptops that are running on these new chips. This comes as AMD reported its client chip sales, including consumer PC chips, fell 65% on the year in Q1. Twitter created a new free API access tier for verified government and publicly owned services that use it for critical purposes like uh, transport or emergency notifications, stuff like that. Uh, if this new tier had not been created, many of those services would have had to use a very expensive enterprise level tier if they wanted to keep operating those alerts. Would you like a machine to write your next cover letter? Well, now you can. LinkedIn has a new feature for premium subscribers to let AI draft a message to the hiring team. This would use your own profile and the information on it, as well as information from the company and information on the hiring manager and what they're looking for to create a personalized message from you. I see you like golf. I too like golf. Please hire me. <laughs> uh, spotting fake product reviews is going to get easier all the time. Uh, tools to help you spot those fake reviews have been around for a while. And Mozilla wants in on the game. So it acquired Fake Spot, one of those tools that has been around for a while. Uh, Mozilla plans to keep supporting Fake Spot's existing site. If you use that, it's not going away. Mozilla is going to keep supporting Fake Spot's Chrome plugin. Uh, but one of the reasons they acquired it is they want to integrate it into the Firefox browser. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission found that Meta has repeatedly violated privacy promises that it made in a 2019 settlement. Among the violations were failure to cut off developers' access to data if a user did not use the developer's app for more than 90 days. It also determined that contact controls in Messenger Kids were not adequate. The FTC proposes that Meta should be prevented from making money off of data collected from users younger than 18 years of age and limit its use of facial recognition. Meta has 30 days to respond to the proposed findings. Also, this is like the the settlement of a previous breach of a previous settlement. Like, uh, read the TechCrunch article on that because the history is almost too hilarious. Pass keys. Pass keys are a cryptographically sound way to sign in securely without needing a password. Uh, we have a great episode to know a little more on that. They are as secure as the device you store them on. So as long as you are properly securing your phone or computer, they're the best security you can have. Yeah. And so now Google, which helped develop pass keys through the FIDO Alliance, supports them for Google account logins. That means... If you choose, and you, you, you can choose, you can replace passwords and multiple factors with this instead. Google's passkeys work on iOS and Android 9 and can be shared across devices using password managers like Dashlane or 1Password or cloud services like iCloud or Google Cloud. But they're never shared with Google, and Google wants to stress that. So there's no risk of your passkey getting fished or taken from a Google database leak or hack if that were to happen. You can even sign in from a device that isn't yours. Maybe you're wanting to watch YouTube on a hotel TV, for example. Without storing the passkey on that device, which <laughs> you should not do, uh, you can also revoke passkeys in Google account settings if you happen to lose a device. Now, Scott... Pretty much everybody in the DTNS audience understands passkeys and can choose to use them, and many do. But can we convince our friends and family of their importance? Because I think that's where we all get more secure. 
Sure. I feel like uh, we're back to where, you know, the importance of two-factor authentication was before that text-based verification. These these various ways of trying to add layers of security to your account are sometimes a little hard to tell people how they work. It's just an education process. Um, you know, for example, if I'm going to try to explain what passkey is to my mom, it's probably going to be difficult. Actually having her use passkey probably be simple, and which is mm -hmm. what I like about it. Um, mm -hmm. you don't really need to know that much. You just kind of need to know to get it. And now that there's a company as big as Google, who was already involved, like you said, in the Fido Alliance, uh, finally saying, look, this is how we're going to move forward or here, you know, now you can do it, get your pass key and let's go. That to me says they're locked in. And that probably means more will follow. Big names are going to follow. And then the small names follow. And then the websites we all sub to that are smaller or weirder or whatever, will end up with pass key support as well. Um, so I, I hope this takes off because this, this is just one more step toward a direction that is nothing is ever perfect, right? We're never, I don't know if we ever get to perfect, but this is a, the, a far cry better than having stuff stored in other, some other database, something somebody could breach even with crazy, uh, security and encryption in play. So I'm really stoked about this. And I, I hope that the education process goes well because that's been proven to be a little hard in the past well the, the education process is different for pass keys and the barrier i think is different with multi-factor authentication the barrier was having to do something you know having to teach yeah. someone how to use off yeah or, there's an authenticator you, know, yeah, you gotta go exactly. and copy paste yeah whereas mm -hmm. the barrier to entry with pass keys is trust because like you said, Scott, it's dead simple. You say, yes, I want to do pass keys. And they say, great, it's now stored on this device and you can log into your account using this device. Uh, we're not to the point where they're going to take away your password. So you'll always have that as a fallback. But even someday, if you get to that point, uh, as long as you are logging in with an email address that you can access elsewhere, you'll be able to recover your pass keys using your email address. So I think this is simple to explain. Like, oh, this is, you, you just do this. And then every time you want to log in, you'll tap a button on your phone. Or in some cases, if you're on your phone, you won't even have to tap a button. It'll just do it automatically. Yeah. That's where you're going to get people saying like, well, hold on. How is that secure? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to do that. And that's that's when it becomes harder to explain because you have to explain the FIDO to and web off and, and, and all of that to really understand it. And public key cryptography, which again, we have a know a little more episode about, but I don't know if that's the most efficient way to convince a family member to trust passkeys. Yeah, yeah I, I pulled a couple um, of folks who I will not mention by name, but, you know, people who I feel like uh, this is uh, not, the, these terms are not super familiar to them. Mm -hmm. the, the question I got three times in a row was, well, what if somebody steals my phone? Then they can just yeah. get in anywhere? That, and that that is that is the right question to ask, which mm -hmm. is that is why you need to make sure you secure the device your passkey is on. So yeah. your phone should be protected, not just by biometrics, not just by face ID or touch ID, uh, but it should be protected by a sufficiently complex password so that people can't hack into the phone. Now, the other thing to, to realize is that you can deauthorize the passkey remotely. So if you can get into your account, say on a laptop and you've lost your phone, you can deauthorize the passkey on that phone. So that gives you a little extra protection too. Mm -hmm. But it's still way less likely that you're going to lose your phone and someone will figure out how to crack in and take your pass keys than it is that someone is going to crack into a database at T-Mobile and get your password. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I, Stay for so the rest of the show to find out more about that. <laughs> yeah, right. It just seems like there's a real opportunity here uh, for for security to go in a, in a, I don't know, a better better way overall. And I know they're competing standards with other standards that would like to get in there and stuff. So I'm still a little worried about that. Like what, which one are people going to stick with? What I am happiest about is things that you already like and use. Like I already really like and use one password. I think they're awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's nice to know that, that they will be there to let me share across devices using that manager. And if others have managers, they prefer same thing. I mean, ultimately the goal would be password lists. We don't have to think about it. Our devices just have our thing and we're good. I think that is the future, but uh, 
you know, uh, hopefully this goes smooth. And yeah, can, the the, the two weak spots are like making sure people have proper device security because I know a lot of people have one two three four or zero 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 as their passcode on a phone because that's easy, yeah. right? Yeah. And the so or we're mom's we're birthday to, or something right, yeah. that's easily found out by somebody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I found out by mom's passcode this weekend, and I was like. Mom, no. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that's a separate thing. Uh, the the other the other issue is going to be uh, that idea that the passcodes are shared across platforms isn't going to work perfectly until yeah. probably next year because Windows hasn't fully rolled it out. And yes, you can store it in iCloud, but when you store it in iCloud, that's not going to work in, in, in non-Apple devices, like if you're on a Windows machine or something. Linux still needs to make some work to, to bring support in as well. So in a couple of years, that's going to happen. It's all going to be taken care of. Probably by the end of this year, you'll get most of it taken care of. But that's, mm -hmm. that's the other roadblock. To, to people adopting it is getting on it and then going, well, wait, why isn't it working over here? Well, this isn't easier. I have to use a password over there. Yeah. yeah. And then there's just the whole transition of smaller. We talked about this morning on TMS, smaller sites getting in line with it. And that's just yeah, going to take, there'll too. be a long tail on this and that's, that'll all work out in the end. But at least your pass keys can be stored in, well, one password in Dashlane. Uh, I, I know LastPass wants to do it, but I don't think they're doing it yet. Mm. Um, but they can be stored in the password manager along with the password. So as the sites convert, you can use the same manager to, to manage that stuff. Uh, in fact, speaking of Dashlane, uh, real quickly, you may see some news that Dashlane does not support passkey. That's confusing, I know. Uh, Dashlane will let you store passkeys in its password manager, but it is not supporting passkey for logging into Dashlane itself, at least not yet. Uh, Dashlane, however, is rolling out its own device-based passwordless login in the coming months, which replaces passwords with cryptographic keys that use a PIN or biometrics on a mobile device. So you may go, well, wait, why not just use passkey instead of making their own thing that's almost the same as passkey? Uh, CEO John Bennett said that right now passkeys tend to get stuck in a single ecosystem. So they want to wait until it's fully ro rolled out across all the platforms. Uh, Dashlane plans to open source some aspects of the passwordless tech it did develop to get more eyes on it and plug any potential vulnerabilities there. All right, let me throw out a term for y'all right. and see who has heard of what semantic got, decoders. <laughs> okay. Nope. 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 It, 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 I don't blame you because uh, it's new. It's a term for a new system, at least a term for a system, that could turn a person's brain activity into text when they listen to a person speak or maybe they imagine a person speaking. You might say, okay, so now robots are reading our minds? Not quite yet. Let me explain a little bit more. Scientists at the University of Texas at Austin published a study about the system in the journal Nature Neuroscience. Here's how it works. A person listens to hours of podcasts while in an fMRI scanner. The measurements from the MRI are then used to train a large language model, LLM. Then that model can take the image scanner output and decode what word the, or words the individual is hearing because there's patterns there. They also That also worked when the individual imagined a story. So, Scott, how well did it actually work? Well, Sarah, not all that precisely. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you feel about what I'm going to say next, it could generate text that was either the same or at least close to the intended meaning of what the individual was imagining or hearing about half the time. So we're about 50% there. But as, uh, as this gets better, of course, semantic decoders could help people who are mentally conscious yet unable to physically speak. Uh, for example, somebody after having a stroke is a good example. Tom, does this surprise and delight or freak you out? Like, where are we at percentage-wise about how Tom feels about this thing? Uh, let's see. Uh, surprise, 8%. Uh, delight, 22%. Freak out, 12%. Uh, mm. The rest, uh, dead inside, I guess. I don't know why I have so much <laughs> left over uh, with, with that. I know, no, I'm like, the percentages, you, you have a lot of room for other feelings. A lot feelings. of room for other emotions. <laughs> Very complex in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like thought the, the brain most, itself. I'm not, I'm not surprised at all that you would be able to take some patterns and relate it to some text. I'm not surprised. In fact, maybe I'm surprised that it's as good as 50%. I'm not surprised that it's, it's not you know, near 90 or a hundred percent. Cause that's difficult 
We don't understand enough about the brain as it is. And so you might not be using the right parts of the brain to do this. We're just mm -hmm. kind of taking a scattershot approach and saying, look at all these brain waves in there somewhere are the ones related to these words. And the machine learning is like, yeah, I think I see these. These seem to correlate. So, so none of that surprises me. I thought what was most interesting about this study was the fact that it was able to get the gist yeah. Uh, so yeah. often. So there, there was one example here that was mostly the gist. The actual words that the person was hearing was the night I went upstairs to what had been our bedroom and not knowing what else to do. I turned out the lights and lay down on the floor. The only thing it got right was lay down on the floor. What the machine decoded was we got back to my dorm room. I had no idea where my bed was. <laughs> I just assumed I would sleep on it. But instead, I lay down on the floor. <laughs> Wow. Now, even though those are totally different stories, the laying down on the floor is very specific. Yeah. Right? And it got yeah. that part right. Yeah. That 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 might point to further research of like, okay, can we isolate what part of the scanner was seeing that gets you those exacts and maybe narrow in on what part of the 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 brain we should be scanning, right? Right. I like this one. Um a participant listened to a speaker say I don't have my driver's license yet. And then had their tr their thoughts translated as, quote, she has not even started to learn to drive yet. They Which got very is, parental for some reason. Yeah. It's, it's the gist, yeah. It's right, the gist. right. Yeah. again, like, I, I'm not sure if the, the participant was male or female, but it's not incorrect. Mm -hmm. It's just not, ex you know, verbatim, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, like, can a thought ever be verbatim to a sentence? Maybe. I mean, I don't 50 percent feels like this is a huge leap and this is insane and we may get to 100 percent one day. And if we well, do, we're talking about a lot of applications potentially for this thing. Oh, hold, hold on to we keep saying thoughts. These aren't thoughts. Right. right. These are things you hear. So and, and right. yes, they are things you can imagine. Brain spikes, hearing, but you have to um, you have to imagine hearing it for it to translate just thinking doesn't show up here because we're always thinking and that does it it is simply what goes through the auditory processing of our brain that gets right. matched up here yeah. so it isn't as good as being able to to read your thoughts even though every headline wants to say that um it also requires you to be in an mri machine and be trained and someone who can't speak could still do that you could play things for them and train on that but then you don't really know how good we'd have to get this really good to be able to have that be a reliable way for someone to communicate. Otherwise, they could be we could be thinking they're saying things that they're not. quite. Yeah. Honest. And if you're stuck in a here's here's an example for me. You put me in an MRI tube. Here's what happens. The voice says, drink your cup of coffee. And my brain translates back. Get me out of this stupid tube. Like, I feel like that if we ever get to the true, what are we thinking? We're in trouble because the stuff I think inside of a tiny tube is not good. Yeah. I want out. I don't like MRIs either. Uh, yeah. Not yeah. my most fun hours of the day. No. But they yeah, suck. you know, I, I, practical applications. Listen, if uh, you know, the, Scott, the example you used, somebody who maybe had a stroke and was having a hard time communicating mm. normally, um, you know, or you know, um, verbally. Um, right. This is great. Yeah. But you know, but you know, going a little bit more, I don't know, uh, just kind of sci-fi with it. It's like translating dreams in yeah. some sense you know yeah. you know you know maybe there's some sort of reoccurring thing that's really bothering you or you're trying to make sense of or is going to help you in your less subconscious state that's where this all gets really interesting yeah like yeah. a real like uh, a real lie detector you know like one that yeah. can really hear what you're thinking this this Boy. is one of those situations where it could get better. We don't know if it will get better because we don't yeah. know if the data we're working with from the brain, because we don't know enough about how the brain works, is good enough to get better. And the large language models are probably getting better, mm -hmm. but there's some dispute about that as well. So yeah. I don't know. What do you think about this kind of story, folks? There was another one kicking around about a mouse uh, that using being able to, to decode the visual processor in mice. Uh, do you like these stories? Uh, let us know. Get in touch with us on the socials. We're at DTNS Show on Twitter and Mastodon, mstdn.social, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and at DTNS Picks on Instagram. On April 28th, just a day before my sister's birthday, T-Mobile notified affected customers that it discovered a data breach 
on March 27th that had been going on since February. T-Mobile filed a breach notification estimating that it impacted 836 customers. Not a lot in this case, though previous breaches at T-Mobile had affected more people. The attackers in this case accessed full names, dates of birth, addresses, contact info, government IDs, social security numbers, and T-Mobile account pins. Uh, those are the pins used to make changes to your account, something that would be a boon for SIM swappers. T-Mobile says no personal financial information or call records were accessed, but Sarah, this is not the first time this has happened, right? Tom, it is not. Uh, this is the second breach of T-Mobile announced just this year, but it's the ninth since 2018. Josh wrote into DTNS on the story, uh, Josh observed, T-Mobile's past breaches have seemingly had no lasting impact on their reputation as evidenced by their recent successful quarter. T-Mobile reported $19.63 billion in revenue last quarter with earnings of $1.58 per share. Now, Josh, Josh is suggesting we need new laws to address this. But do we? I mean, I don't. I don't know if we need new jobs or uh, sorry, laws for laws. This. <laughs> Somebody yeah, needs not a jobs. new job. We don't need new jobs. You were jumping sure. to firing people at T-Mobile, weren't you? I mean, Tom, you're a T-Mobile user. Are you? Yeah. You've you've been through this so, now nine yeah, times. I, I, Are you I, like? I, you know? I guess the you know the you know Josh saying we need new laws to address this is addressing the this has happened a lot to T-Mobile. You know, from 2018 to 2023, we've got nine rather major data breaches. You know, mm -hmm. at what point do customers say, nope, no more, I'm going elsewhere. Tom, no. you use T-Mobile. I mean, you're still there. So I what's up? I, under I understand Josh's fr frustration. Uh, and where my head is usually at is... T-Mobile, I know they're a company and it's not fashionable to like companies these days, but they're the victim of attacks here. Let's not lose sight of that. They aren't asking to be attacked, uh, and nor do I think they're leaving the doors wide open. Hackers and attackers are getting very sophisticated and finding ways to get into systems uh, that involve humans. Uh, they have not detailed what happened in this last breach, but a lot of times it's somebody gets tricked and that's how they get into the network. And those are very hard to defend against. Why is T-Mobile having more of these than usual is a very good question. Is there something they're not doing well enough? I think more transparency on their, that are their part would help us evaluate that as customers. On the other hand, I probably should be concerned that it's this many in this amount of time. But all that stuff we mentioned, uh, address, government ID, contact info, all of us have had that leaked at other places besides T-Mobile. I mean, it, the the big hacks of the credit reporting agencies, there's a breach every other day. It's not like T-Mobile is unique in having this sort of stuff accessed. So to me, the question is bigger than T-Mobile. Is there something we can do better as an industry to stop me from feeling like, yeah, uh, that kind of information just isn't protected anywhere. Why should I be upset about T-Mobile any more than anywhere else? Yeah. So. I will add that I was one of the the people that T-Mobile contacted when they had a data breach four or five years ago. I got a little text message telling me, mm -hmm. like, yeah, your number was one of them. Sorry. Um, and they gave me, like, a free year of McAvee. And I already had Equifax at that time. Because, oh, yeah. We're yeah. all we're yeah. all on permanent free credit yeah. monitoring these days with the number of breaches out there. Be because, yeah. and you know, I've had, all, like... I count five times, one from my old company uh, that Tom knows, and then uh, one from T-Mobile, one from an internet company. That just, I yeah, well, I, I think we so all, I, I've got one from Comcast yeah. that just happened that, that is yeah. allowing me to continue. Yeah, that's and, just and I, unending, And I've, right? I've gone, and this is what's dangerous. I, I've gotten numb to it. Like, I just like, well, you know, it's out there. I mean, there's only so many things I can do. And I'm wondering to uh, Josh, uh, um, to Josh's particular uh, uh, sentiment, would would it make sense to have kind of a kind of a, a, a broad standard in the same way that we have, for example, we, we stress test banks to make sure mm. that they have enough funds to 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 see them through like a banking crisis? Would it make sense for uh, companies that store your personal data to have a, reached like you know some level of security that like a pen tester or a company that does pen testing um, will do and just say okay you meet this you you meet this level of security you can put this on your site saying like you you meet you know class A uh, uh, level of data security for your for your customers you know 
and maybe kind of have sort of a a thing around that because right now it's still kind of a hodgepodge some companies do great some companies do less great but it's just a giant mishmash of you know various standards and and uh, uh efficacies i don't even know if there's standards per se right i was using uh, calling it standards is, is a little yeah. bit harsh now the go- the u.s government has tried to put in more security uh policies especially around the the solar winds attack and and that kind of stuff but it doesn't seem to really protect this kind of information because that kind of information is not that valuable anymore because it's so easily gotten out there what these attackers are doing is trying to find a few juicy targets right they don't care about me and you so much as like who else they might be able to get when they when they go in there and and try and it's cheap to try so I don't know if there is anything short of mandating uh, a more expensive encryption if you're a company of a certain size that that would change this. And that's sad. I, I tend to think, and this is just me beating the same old drum, that providing secure personal ID management would help. So you don't have this stuff stored in so many databases all over. You can do what they're doing with Passkey, where they're like, hey, that data is on your device, and so it's almost impossible to get because we're not storing it in a database that can be breached. You could do that with personal information as well. I, I will bring out Tim Berners-Lee's Inrupt uh, as, as an example, but there are other people working on that sort of thing uh, where you could do data ma- ID management that doesn't keep it all in databases. I feel like that, and maybe there could be some laws that encourage that, but that would be a better way than just passing a law or doing audits because that's so cumbersome and costly. Mm-hmm. All right, well... You know what isn't cumbersome and costly, Tom? <laughs> no, no. I was going to say, if people, With any have luck, thoughts, if people have thoughts on this, they should send us an email. Feedback they... <laughs> at DailyTechNewsShow.com, where we will read it on the mailbag. Indeed. This one comes from Atia. And uh, back on Monday's show, we had mentioned that AI pioneer Jeffrey Hinton had left Google in order to freely express his concerns about AI. And he has them. Matia said... Could one reason why Jeffrey Hinton is speaking out be sour grapes? Matias says, if I recall recently, Google joined two internal AI teams that reportedly didn't like each other, Brain and DeepMind AI Research Labs. These team mergers often create intense political battles as the mergers impact the roles and responsibilities of top management. Uh, it's a reasonable question. Uh, the, a lot of times when when teams are merged, there can there can be a little culture battle. Uh, that that's not unreasonable to wonder. I would say, Mattia, is there any evidence of that in anything Jeffrey Hinton has done? Uh, and I don't see it. He has been very complimentary of Google, which, yeah, even if you have sour grapes, you might say that just so you you know a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. But he's not picking on Google. He's saying, you know what? I couldn't talk about anything because it was a conflict of interest. So I'm 75. I left Google so that I could talk about the fact that we need to have control of these systems. We need to figure out how to control them while we're developing them before we develop them to a point where they're out of control. And that's something I could say internally at Google, but I couldn't say it as widely uh, without leaving Google. And maybe you just felt it was time to leave Google yet. So if there's any evidence of sour grapes, I don't see it. Mm. Yeah, I tend to agree. Also, I think that um, I think that if you come out of that thing with some misgivings about where it's headed, even if you were help you help pioneer it, or you're considered, you know, I've heard people refer to him as the grandfather of of this entire AI movement. Um, if you if you start running into issues where you're like, this isn't what I meant, or this is what I want, and this genie's out of the bottle, but I just can't in good conscience, like all those things. I don't know. I feel like we should celebrate that a little and and. and- I don't and then think he has misgivings. I don't think he regrets anything he did. I don't see any evidence of that in what he's saying. What I see is him saying, hey, things are starting to speed up now. And yeah. we need to make sure that we keep pace with the speed before it gets out of control. That's yeah. that's not misgivings or why did I do this? That That is like, I, I feel like the entire industry, not just the part that I was working in, uh, needs to have a parallel effort of controlling these systems. It does feel like we want to assign Oppenheimer status to him and, yeah. and make it so he's like, what have I it's done tempting. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's just from a dramatic standpoint, it's tempting, but I, I think you're ultimately right about that. I don't know. I, I wish him the best. I hope he's, you know, take some time with your grandkids. You'll be happy. <laughs> 
His grandkids are all AI. Oh, no. Uh, uh, real quickly, an employee of Samsung's subsidiary in Austin uh, wanted to speak to the company's ban on AI tools. We were wondering, well, now that Samsung has put a pause on using ChatGPT, won't people just find a workaround? This employee says, well, overall, it's banned. Most of us have moved to just using our phone to get the answers we need and forwarding via email on our or our, through our chat app. This does prevent us from uploading potentially sensitive code, but still allows me to ask generic questions. Personally, I use it several times a week to write scripts, utilizing scripting languages that I am far from expert on, like VBS scripts. It's really good at write a script to find the oldest files in a directory and delete them type scripts. Mm. Mm. Um, that's good info, uh, Samsung employee. Thanks for letting us know. Yeah, and and, and letting Nika, us know that there are workarounds. That yes, they are, they did find a workaround pretty fast. <laughs> Uh, you know what can never get a workaround is having Scott Johnson on this show. Um, no AI could ever be you, Scott. Never. Never. Nope. Until never. it is. But until, until it then. Until he reveals that it's been until an Until then, then, you are one unique individual. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do. Well, we can do that. Um, I'm very excited <laughs> because last week in the middle of a Vegas event that I was uh, helping host, I announced the finally uh, ready Kickstarter for my new tabletop card game called Dungeon Murder at DungeonMurder.com. Uh, that URL will take you straight to the Kickstarter now. Kickstarter is live, up and going. We blew past our first uh, goal and are well on our way to a bunch of stretch goals. Uh, very happy about it. But if you're hearing this for the first time or heard me talk about it before and you're like, I might want to see what the hubbub's about, go check it out. There's a whole video about the game, how it works, what's going on with it. And uh, I can't wait for you to try the game. Again, that is over at Dungeon Murder. Dot com. Well, congrats on the launch. This Thank will be you. fun. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Also, congrats to us on getting a brand new boss. That boss's name is Todd. Todd just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Todd. Glad to have you along for the ride. Hey, patrons, give Todd a big old pat on the back and tell him to stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. Writer Hugh Howey thinks in a year or two we may be able to go from a film script to a full video produced by a machine in less than a day. Just feed in the script, instant film. Do we want that? We're going to talk mm. about that on Good Day Internet. But just a reminder, DTNS is live Monday through Friday. You can catch it at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can also find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>